Hello and welcome to another edition of Ask the Experts here on City News 570. I'm joined today by Faisal Suziwala. Faisal is Canada's top real estate broker. He's also ranked within the top five in the world for Remax. Faisal started his career at the young age of 18 and has been de uh, delivering outstanding results for over 30 years now, most notably with Remax Twin City Realty. The man knows what he's talking about and is willing to give us some of his time today. Welcome back to the show, Faisal. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, Brock. Thanks for having me on. So, so happy to have you back with us. Listeners, if you are interested in any of the information we discuss over the next hour, please reach out to Faisal. You can start your journey at homeshack.com. You can call him directly 519-624-5555 or by email at Faisal at homeshack.com. Later in the show, we're going to spend some time talking with Faisal about his book, The Real Deal, Billion Dollar Real Estate Broker. The book is currently available on Amazon and Audible and Kindle as well. In the meantime, there's so much to talk about over the next hour, Faisal. Can you start us off with a, with a market update? What's 2023 looking like right now? 2023 is looking good. It's not as uh, as grim as we had expected. Uh, we are expecting an interest rate hike coming up. Uh, but I don't believe, and again, don't quote me on this, but I don't believe that's going to have any sort of impact on the actual lending rate. And if there is an increase, if the Bank of Canada does increase the rates, the expectation is that this will be the last one and it will become sort of uh, normal uh, business, and we hope that people have sort of gotten used to uh, what the rates are right now, and now they are budgeting accordingly and spending accordingly. And who knows? Maybe this is the uh, last uh, uh, straw in getting inflation under control. But again, as we've spoke about this in the past, I don't think that interest rates is the only answer in getting inflation under control. We know that uh, there's been a new program as well that's just been announced. Um, first time uh, or first home savings account. What what do we need to know about that? So this first home savings account, and we just learned about this from our friends at RBC, Mark Figueredo and Drew Taylor, uh, and do reach out to these uh, fine young gentlemen about this program. And what they're offering and what the government has mandated now is a new program, which was announced in the budget for 2022, where the first home savings account known as the FHSA, which is a new registered account to help individuals save up to $40,000 dollars on a tax-free basis to wow. purchase the first home. So what that means, and let, let, let's make it a very simple example. I have a 21-year-old and I've got a soon-to-be 18-year-old. So as soon as my daughter is 18 years old in May, my intent is to open an FHSA account, a first home savings account for her. Now, that the day that opens, it's for five years, so in on the fifth year of the anniversary of opening that account, my daughter can withdraw up to $40,000 from that account. Now she doesn't have to put in, the limit is $8,000 per year you can put in, but you can right. wait until the fifth year, okay, to put $40,000 into that account. Wow. And then withdraw that $40,000 from that account to buy your first home. Now it's only for first, time home buyers or someone who hasn't owned a home for five years. And, you know, there's a lot of details and our friends at RBC, Drew and Mark can talk a little bit more about this if you want information. But what this will do, the, 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 the amazing part about this program is when you withdraw your money from an RSP, for example, that calendar year is where you get the tax break. That's okay? right. You've been contributing that money all these years, and finally you take that money out. And let's say that's the year where your income wasn't quite so high. Um, you know, the tax break doesn't really offset um, your income level. But if you withdraw this money on the fifth year, this is the FHSA account, on the fifth year, you take $40,000 out. You do not have to claim that $40,000 against your income that year. You're, so basically, let's say my daughter graduates, goes to university, has a job, and she she wants to wait 10 years before she uses that $40,000 because her income level will be higher. So she'll be in a higher tax bracket. That's the time that she should then offset her income with this $40,000. So 
to, to those parents that are out there, as soon as your child is 18 years old, just open the account. You don't have to put any money in there. There's no fees on this account. This is the best plan that I've seen the government bring out to help first-time home buyers get into the market. And it doesn't have to be the full forty thousand dollars, but at the limit is eight thousand. And just like the TFSAs, at some point, um, they'll probably increase that limit. Now, the good thing with this, the good thing with this account is that that money can be transferred into an RRSP if they don't end up buying a home. Okay. So there's nothing lost and it does not take away your contribution limit on the RRSP. So right. if you're not a set limit, you can, this is an addition too. Also, this account can be used for investments. So if you want to buy stocks and bonds or investment certificates or whatever it might be, you can do that within this account. And the growth is also tax-free in the account. So it's a fantastic for plan, fantastic plan. And I would suggest that, you know, our, like I said, Mark Figueredo and Drew Taylor at RBC are, are great guys that can that launch this program to our team. And uh, we're sharing with uh, the listeners here. Thanks so much for, for filling us in with that. That's the first home savings account. That nice. idea of getting getting people thinking about, you know, as, as Faisal was saying, you hit the that, that magic age of 18 and you can start putting that money in there and, uh, it's it's a great uh, it's a great nest egg that that's going to be there for them down the road as well too. Great great information to and that's a, that's a great way to start a new year as well too. Great to hear that. If if we take a look, Faisal, maybe at this the first quarter of 2023, say January through March, what are you expecting when we look at things like interest rates or sales activity? What's what's going to be happening? I, I don't expect the interest rates to continue climbing this year, but I do expect that there will most likely be a decline in the market of up to 5% in the first quarter. Now, if you look at just traditional stats, uh, the winter season is usually slower. And in any given year, we'll see a spike in the market in the spring. We'll see um, maybe a 5% increase in the spring. And that continues through the summer. And then you get into the fall, and the market drops another 3 to 5%. So I think we're going to go back to that type of trajectory and, 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 and uh, activity increasing in the spring, activity decreasing in the fall. And again, it'll just be a sort of a balanced normal market. I don't expect prices to decline as much as a lot of the media has made out to and a lot of the economists are saying that prices could drop another 15%. And we've talked about this several times on the show before, that the fundamentals haven't changed. Right. Right. Crisis. We have a need for 80,000 new homes to be built in Waterloo region uh, by the year 2030. We have half a million new immigrants coming in every year. We have a 1.5 million home shortage in Canada. Where are these people going to live? So that for that reason alone, I do not, I do not expect that the market is going to continue to decline because the demand is going to be high. And builders are not producing new product because it's simply too expensive to produce new product in this market. They pay too much for the land. Construction cost is too high. Supply chain isn't cooperating. Inflation is too high. So with all of this going on, builders are saying, there's no way I'm going to add another 500 homes to my portfolio of construction when I have no buyers out there. But in two years, my expectation, here's my crystal ball, right? In two years, I do expect that the market will turn around and we're going to start seeing uh, the rise again, and then we're going to see a decline in the interest rate. So that's kind of my prediction this year. I think it will be a pretty balanced market. Uh, I know there's a lot of negativity out there, but I certainly don't buy into that because it just doesn't make sense. And it's not like previous recessions that we've had. There's going to be a need that needs going to be fulfilled. There's going to be immigrants coming in with money. They're going to buy up the housing. It's going to happen. And, and we'll talk about the, the foreign home ban um, in a moment as well. But th this, this is not going to be the doom and gloom year that I, that I hear about day in and day out. That's good. That's all good news. And, and, and just earlier today, they mentioned the idea that uh, south of the border, the inflation rate has gone down in the United States. We know that there's always we're always impacted by what happens south of the border. And as, as long as that inflation rate's going down there, that, that bodes well for us north of the border as well, too. It certainly does. We know the rental market was really out of control all the way through 2022. Is that still this, is it still in the same state right now? 
It's interesting. So the unintended consequences of higher interest rates is that the landlord's mortgage payments have also gone up. They've got to offset it by higher rents. So we had an influx. In fact, March through September of last year, we saw the rents jump up, up to 35% in most markets. Okay. Now, what's happened is a lot of people are saying, well, I'm not going to sell. This is a bad market. You know, the prices have come down. I'm not going to sell my home right now. So I'm going to rent my home. So what has happened is now we have an influx of rental inventory in the marketplace. So the rental rates have started to come down, I would say by about 10%. We're still up 20% over where we were, but they have come down about 10%. There's more selection. Believe it or not, we were getting bidding wars on rental properties. We're not seeing that anymore. We're seeing a little bit of incentives being given to tenants that were not being given before. And we're seeing, uh, again, a little bit more of a thoughtful process in finding a rental location, whatnot. People are not just renting out of desperation. They're renting and they're looking at how many units are out there and then they're making a thoughtful decision. So there is some inventory that's increasing on the rental side, but it's certainly by no means cheaper to rent right now than it is to buy so it is it is i think in my opinion a mistake to sign up long term and have the intention that you're going to rent for the next three years because you're going to be out of the market the market's going to go back up rates are going to come back down and you're going to be in the sideline watching everybody buy and get into those bidding wars of 15 times on every property that comes up on the market good information and and the important thing we've talked about this before that idea of You've got to do your homework. You've got to be paying attention to what's going on. Uh, we're coming up on a break here on Ask the Experts. When we come back, the foreign buyer's ban. What is it and why is it important? Stay with us here on City News 570. Welcome back to the show. My guest today is Canada's top real estate broker and author of the book, The Real Deal, billion-dollar real estate broker, Faisal Suziwala. Listeners, if you would like a chance to chat with Faisal yourself, you can start by going to homeshack.com. You can also call Faisal directly, 519-624-5555, or through email, Faisal at homeshack.com. Faisal, you were recently uh, interviewed on City News 570 about the foreign buyer's ban. Can you get into a little bit more detail about what the ban is and, and what impact does it have for us as well? The in in I quoted that it's a smoke and mirrors policy, in my opinion. It, it's just the reality of this appears to be an action aimed at appeasing voters who do not thoroughly even understand the amount of investment that's coming in from foreign, which is less than 3% across Canada. So for the government to say, oh, this is going to solve our housing pro problem, it's again, just another uh, you know, uh, political sort of impact that they're trying to make saying, look, we're doing something to appease you as a population. The reality is that everything that they're talking about can be circumvented by sophisticated investors from abroad. And it's going to happen. Most people that are investing from abroad have a Canadian friend, relative, or a corporation in which they're going to invest their money. Because those sophisticated investors are not buying a $500,000 home. They're buying several homes. So they're using hold codes. And, they're, and so it's being circumvented anyways. It's also, it also has so many exemptions in there. And the exemptions include, of course, Canadian citizens are exempt. Any permanent resident who is not a citizen yet is also exempt. Students who have been here uh, are exempt as long as they don't purchase anything for more than $500,000, which is probably difficult to do anyways. Mm -hmm. um, if they've been working here and filing tax returns here for at least three out of the five years, then they're exempt. Uh, diplomats, counselor staff, international corporations or organizations that are working in Canada are exempt. Foreign nationals are exempt. Temporary resident students are exempt. So there's so many exemptions. Now, here's the interesting part. Cottages and cabins and vacation homes are also exempt. So if I'm a foreign investor, right. I'm going to go up north to Collingwood or Blue Mountain or one of these, Muskoka. We know that this is an investment vehicle that foreign investors are using to shelter their money in safer grounds and enjoy the appreciation. So let's go buy some cottages in in in, in Muskoka and in in, in Musega and in in Blue Mountain and let's park our money there because that's exempt. So and those things that are not exempt are going to be, like I said, circumvented by using local residents as partners 
1% interest and all of a sudden, and the fines are laughable. So Premier Doug Ford had a 20,000, sorry, 20% um, surcharge tax on anyone that's buying who's not a Canadian resident. Mm. That, that was doing a better job at stopping foreign investors from coming in because there's, now they have to add 20% to their purchase price. The fine for purchasing as a foreign investor is ten thousand dollars. That's no matter no matter what the the value is, ten thousand dollars, and they may force you to sell your property. Well, by the time they catch up to you in two years, and they say, "Oh, wait a minute, you bought this property. You're a foreign investor. You need to sell the property." The foreign investor is going to say, "Thank you very much. I just made twenty five percent of my money. Here's your ten thousand dollars. Fine." And they're done. So I don't know how they're going to, first of all, police any of this. And certainly there's going to be so many ways of getting around it. The, the solution here, again, is not giving us these fluff type of policies to stop um, foreign investors from coming in and telling us that that's going to solve the housing problem. What will solve the, house, the housing problem is getting interest rates under control, getting inflation under control, improving supply chain, creating less red tape for builders to be able to go out there and build homes without having all of the bureaucracy that's involved in the cities, and then eliminating the stress test. The stress test, the purpose of that stress test was to add 2% to the lending rate because the lending rates were so low that it would, that in case the rates got up to five and a half or 6%, you could still afford to buy your home. Well, guess what? The rates are at five and a half and 6%. Right. So to add another 2% to that to make you qualify is stopping prospective buyers from getting into the market and forcing them to go into high levels of rent. So if we could just simply eliminate the stress test, that in itself will put some activity back into housing. It's still affordable, but it just will open the doors and you're not having this background insurance here that it, what if the rates go up another two, two and a half percent because it's unexpected. So this is really a time where I think the stress test needs to be looked at and eliminated because the purpose, it served its purpose. It doesn't need to be there anymore. Rates are at work they expected them to be. And now they can get rid of it in my opinion. I don't I don't want to put you on the spot, Fossil, but I I, I can see you might have a, a career in politics if if this whole... <laughs> Real estate thing doesn't work. I and I and I'm happy that you're able to you, you wade through all of these things. You're right. You you talk about there's got to be changes. We we do need to deal with things. But just coming up with the term foreign buyers ban, well, it sounds good. It's a nice little sound clip, but there's no real teeth to it. And and thanks for for clearing all of that up for us as well too. Uh, you mentioned this briefly. We notice there haven't been many shovels going into the ground lately. In your mind, what's causing that lag in, in new construction? So a lot of it had been uh, bureaucracy, right? Like just getting things through the system. And in the time that was lost in getting through things through the system, COVID was a big factor, no question. Um, you know, but again, and I've voiced my frustration several times on your show about, you know, just getting a return phone call or return email from the city staff and everybody's been, you know, hanging their hat on the COVID uh, situation. And that's why, you know, I guess everybody's hooked up to a machine. They can't respond call to your calls anymore. But this has been a very frustra frustrating process for anyone that's been trying to develop. That time loss brought us right into high interest rates. And now the lending is so expensive that builders are saying, well, you know, I can't really afford to take on more debt. I've already got debt on the land. I've already made, I'm already making payments on that. Now I'm paying higher levels on my material costs. And then I'm paying higher interest charges. And at the end of the day, I'm not going to be able to recover that from the consumer because the consumer doesn't have affordability because of the higher interest rates. So it's a vicious cycle that's created almost a stop. So major, major projects and large builders just said, you know what, we've got this figured out. In two years, the government in their infinite wisdom is going to come up and say, oh yeah, well, this whole interest rate thing probably didn't do what it was supposed to do. So let's lower the rates again. Let's pump this 
uh, market up again and let's get people buying again. And at that time, builders will just put their shovels in the ground and get that 20, 25% lift that they're going to lose right now. No builder is going to want to sell at a 20% loss because there's just no, they've already paid premiums for those lots. They're paying premiums for material, premiums for labor. How are they going to make any money at the end of the day? As much as we, we we understand that you know a lot of great builders, especially in this community, are trying to help the community get into housing, they've got to they've got to make a profit. They're running a business, right? That's right. Right now, what what should homeowners be focused on? Is it sit tight, wait and see? What's what mindset should people be in at the moment? Well, as a homeowner, you should be looking at if you're if you're thinking of selling in the next couple of years, look at what improvements you can do to your home, keep up with the latest trends, you know, whether it's just simply painting, uh, updating your bathrooms, updating your kitchen, updating your hardware, just getting your home prepared. So when the market does turn around, you're now waiting. And, you know, interestingly enough, trades are becoming available. We're seeing more um, painters, contractors, handy people available to come in and do work for you. Um, and the costs seem to be coming down a little bit. They're still high, but they're coming down. So this might be a good opportunity. You certainly don't want to wait when everybody's trying trying to do it. And that's the thing. There seems to be a tendency of this herd mentality. Everybody's doing this. I'm going to do this. Sometimes the best decisions are made when everybody else is exiting. That's the time to enter. And I certainly say this again to homeowners that you may want to look at, um, the, especially if you were in a position where you um, did refinance your properties and get lines of credit set up, that there are investment opportunities that are coming down the line. And I think it's going to be a short window. It's probably going to be six to nine months where there will be investment opportunities. And we can certainly talk a little bit more about that. And, and we've got a little bit of time before the break. When we just to come back quickly, that those that idea of improvements. If you said to to uh, someone who might be looking at selling, really the focus is bathrooms and kitchens, or is that is that always seem to be the biggest bang for your buck? Yeah, for sure. Bathrooms, kitchens, flooring, and paint, right? And at very minimum, if you could just freshen up the paint. Uh, make sure the flooring is updated, you know, like those little things, it's going to go a long way. And you could put a lot of makeup on something. So you know, you may have that old oak, and I know a lot of people will be upset about this, but painting oak, well, there's oak cabinets that are still that harvest gold or yellow gold, or yellow, um, yellow oak, you know what, if the profile is modern, paint it, change the hardware, you don't have to go replacing and maybe put a new countertop on or something. And that'll freshen it up in itself. We all need a little spring cleaning and that we might be a little bit early for that, but we can get there. Uh, we'll take a quick break. We got to get an update from the City News 570 News Center. When we come back, tiny homes. Stay with us here on City News 570. Welcome back to the show. My guest today is Canada's top real estate broker and author of the book, The Real Deal, Billion Dollar Real Estate Broker, Faisal Susie Walla. If you would like a chance to chat with Faisal yourself, you can start by going to homeshack.com. You can also call Faisal directly at 519-624-5555 or through email, Faisal at homeshack.com. Faisal, we've heard a lot about in the news, uh, the, the idea, we, uh, the need for more affordable housing. Are we seeing right now tiny homes or accessory units being created here in the region? Uh, and is if so, or even if not, is there a market for these types of accommodations? I believe there absolutely is. We're starting to see that happen more and more now. So uh, sort of summarize what is allowed. Um, one additional accessory unit within the property. So in your home. So you could have a basement apartment as long as it's legal, uh, fire safe and whatnot. And there's the provisions are at every municipality has it printed. So, you know, check in and see what your requirements are. So one unit in your existing home and then one additional unit in your backyard, basically a separate dwelling. And I believe it's just around 765 square feet that can be built. But there are also uh, companies that have started evolving that create these turnkey solutions. Um, they can pop, you know, build it in the factory and pop it into your backyard. You connected your sewer, water, all the services, and I'm simplifying it. But those are great solutions. And I, I've seen them as low as $250,000 
for a turnkey solution. So what that creates is additional income, additional housing. So it's a win-win for everyone, as long as they stay fairly controlled in what the rents are. I saw on the news not that long ago, somebody built one in Guelph and they were charging $2,500 believe in their backyard for this tiny unit, which seemed a little expensive for a tiny home. And is that really creating affordable housing? Or is this is just someone's way of trying to make a few extra bucks in their backyard? So I think the, the idea is great as long as people are not taking advantage of it. And as long as the rents remain uh, fairly affordable, because that's the whole idea behind having this affordable housing or tiny housing in your backyard. So we will see that. And um, safety is a big concern. And again, we were talking before the break, what should people be doing right now? Look, like coming into the spring, if you're planning on putting a secondary unit into your lower level, you may want to talk to your contractors now, get the excavation companies lined up so that they can dig out the side yard to put a door going straight into the basement or at least some accessibility that way so you don't have them going through your home and you know get all of those underground services and whatnot again red tape is a big um issue you know by the time you apply to the time you get your permit could be six months so if you start mm -hmm. now you're going to have the opportunity to be in the ground and maybe completed by by fall and and you, we've talked about that in the past as well too if if there's this call from local governments and from the province and from the federal government, we need more homes, removing some of that red tape is going to go a long way for a lot of people to say, make it simpler for me, and I'd be more than more than willing to take those steps. But if you're making it difficult, I, I'm not necessarily interested in making those those changes. That's right. Like development charges is a big thing, right? You know, that and it's very costly. And they're doing this for builders as well. But it's just how much more incentive can be offered when there's other factors like interest rates that we talked about, land costs that we talked about, material costs that we've talked about. So all these other factors also play in. And let's face it, if they're giving up on one tax, so development charges or whatever, um, we're probably going to see that showing up on our municipal tax bill at some point. So right. you're your, you know, your, your annual tax bill might go up 1%, 2%. I, I understand that in Toronto, it's supposed to go up even more than that to compensate for a lot of these development charges because infrastructure has to be there. Without infrastructure, there will be no development. So you can't have the best of both and say, I don't want to pay for it. Right, exactly. Uh, in, in your mind, how are investors feeling right now? Is it a good time to be an investor? Is it still that idea of, again, coming back to the same idea even for homeowning, right? Is it a wait and see, or is now the time to really start start getting involved in things? So I kind of go back to my journey in real estate, and um, I learn from my own experiences. And I'm looking at today's market and reflecting back on the three prior recessions that I was involved in. And when I look back at it, I, I realized, not intentionally, but there were opportunities in those crisis times that fortunately I was able to enter into the market at those times and reap the benefits of that. So my message to investors right now is don't follow that herd mentality that everybody's parking their money in their bank accounts and not doing anything. Um, they're maybe deploying some of that cash into the money markets, which is fine. I believe in diversification, but I would say don't do an all or nothing. This, in my opinion, is going to be an amazing time to start deploying some of that cash, whether it's through your line of credit, whether through it's your savings, into the real estate market. And, and one of the big things that people are always talking about is, well, I want to be cash flow positive. If I'm not cash flow positive, I'm not going to invest my money into anything unless I'm making a return every month. So here's the thing, I've, and I talk about this in my book quite extensively, that cash flow is not necessarily your friend. There are cash flow properties right now that are multiplexes that you're actually inheriting a little bit of a headache because you're going to have six or seven tenants under one building. Your exit strategy on that type of building is very difficult because you're only going to be able to sell that to another investor. And the valuation of that property is tied to the income alone because your exit is to an investor. Right. So I've often recommended to just my regular day-to-day -day homeowner 
um, that they should be looking at taking some of the equity out of their personal residence and deploying some of that into an investment, such as a townhome, a condo, um, and, and putting your money into that. And then what we see is the objection is, well, I can't afford to lose $400 a month. And I'm not asking people to lose $400 a month, but I'm saying if you can afford not to have that $400 a month, if it's not going to change, if it's still able to put food on your table, let's do that. As, this is an example. And, and I'll tell you, there was a, a, a townhouse that sold for $800,000 in February of 2022. I sold a townhouse in the same complex for $600,000 a month ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we've seen that the value has dropped $200,000. For argument's sake, that townhome today is getting more rent than it was back in February of 2022. So it's getting $2,900 a month rent today. It was getting $2,500 a month rent back in 2022. But the rates, interest rates were lower back then. So the mortgage rate uh, did not cause them to have a negative cash flow. They were breaking even. Yeah. Today, due to the higher interest rate, but remember the purchase price is lower. So there's some offset there. But let's just say there's a $500 per month negative cash flow, which equates to $6,000 a year. In three years, that's $18,000. Let's round it up to $20,000. To buy that $600,000 townhome today, you have to spend $120,000 of down payment, 20%. Now your negative cash flow is $6,000 6, a year, $20,000 over three years. We've already tested values at $800,000 on that property. We know that when times were good, when interest rates were low, and they will not remain high forever, and times will not remain bad forever, things will turn around, that that property will sell for, at worst case scenario, in my expectation calculations, $800,000 in three years to four years. So on $120,000 investment today and $20,000 negative cash flow over that three years, if you can turn around and make an extra $200,000 on that money, yeah. you're putting in your pocket 200 plus your 120 coming back to you on a $120,000 original investment. How is that a bad idea? Right. And I, you said, I think the key thing, and you, you, when you mentioned this, that idea of an exit strategy, right? A lot of people go into these things having these grandiose ideas. Okay, we're going to do this. And you say, well, how long are you going to own this property for? Oh, you know, maybe they haven't really thought that your idea is this is you, you need to, you, this is a finite thing. You need to know the beginning, the middle and the end before you get started. And not only, you know, you may not want to exit. I, I, I think of myself as a property hoarder. I don't get rid of anything. I like to accumulate. And, and here's the, here's the value. When that property is worth $800,000 in three years, I can go to the bank and get 80% financing on that, get my initial down payment back out of it and go put it down on another property. So it's basically a rinse and repeat. Build up that portfolio. And again, I talk about that in my book is how do you create wealth? You don't create wealth by buying and selling, buying and selling, flipping. That's not how you create wealth. You create wealth by holding on and leveraging. And that's and I'm glad you mentioned your book as well too, because I do want to come back to that. We'll take a final break on Ask the Experts. When we come back, Faisal and I are going to spend some time talking about his book, The Real Deal, Billion Dollar Real Estate Broker. We're also going to look into that crystal ball that he brings with him every time. Stay with us here on City News 570. Welcome back to the show. My guest today, Faisal Susie Walla, also known as Canada's top real estate broker. Listeners, if you would like a chance to chat with Faisal yourself, start by going to homeshack.com. You can also call Faisal directly, 519-624-5555, or through email, Faisal at homeshack.com. Before the break, we were taking it, or we were talking about uh, investments. In your mind, Faisal, what are the typical types of investments that you would suggest to people? So right now in the marketplace, I'm looking at four different types of investments that I'm recommending and depends on what resonates with people and what they, what they have an appetite for. Um, townhomes have always been one of my favorite. So whether they're stacked townhomes, um, freehold or condo, both are equally as good. And sometimes the condo is not a bad idea because it um, takes the maintenance 
factor away from the tenant and there's someone taking care of things. So I'm not a huge fan, and, and a lot of my developer and builder friends won't like me saying this, not a huge fan of high rises. High rise condominiums, I don't think we're there yet where I would recommend just simply because the condo fees can be quite high. And um, a lot of factors can implement the value of that building. So I'm not a huge fan of that. But mid-rise, uh, four-story, five-story condo buildings are great. Townhomes are great. Stacked townhomes are amazing. Creates higher density, lots of opportunity and affordability. Getting into multiplexes, if you can stomach dealing with tenants, or if you have a good management company that's willing to do it, and if you can get the revenue to work, that's good, but it does contradict what I said earlier. It's not a great exit exit strategy because right. once you own a fourplex, fiveplex, sevenplex, nineplex, and I own a nineplex myself, that I, I keep because of emotional attachment to it. But it causes me more grief than all my other properties combined, <laughs> right? And um, but and and if I ever want to sell that property, it's not going to be to a first time home buyer or an investor who is just, you know, parking their money. It's going to have to be a sophisticated investor who knows how to deal with tenants. And lastly, I really have, am looking at and focusing on redevelopment opportunities. So this is infill type of properties, and it goes sort of hand in hand with creating more housing, higher density, intensification. So you take an 80-foot lot with a house on it. Right. What I see there is three or four townhomes down the road, right? And again... You're going to be faced with challenges. You're going to get the NIMBYs, not in my backyard people, that are going to say, I don't want to see four townhouses in my neighborhood. These are single family homes. But look, the provincial mandate, the government policies, the, the mandate is for intensification. So whether you like it or not, if you are in a neighborhood where you see 60, 80, 100 foot lots and they're serviced, chances are someone's going to be coming in there, buying it, renting it out for a few years, demolishing it and creating more housing, intensifying that area. So we're going to see that happen. And just to step back for a second, that idea of, and you talked about dealing with tenants and so on, when it, from, from an investment point of view, if people don't want to get their hands dirty, let's say, as you mentioned before, there are management organizations that you can go through that will will kind of deal with the day-to-day. -day. You are the one that's that's footing the bill, basically, um, and you can be sort of that step away from, from the tenants, really. Absolutely. I mean, management companies are not that expensive if you look at what they actually do. So mm -hmm. they're they're handling all of the little nuisances that you get, like, you know, my fridge doesn't work, my washer's not washing, my dryer's not drying, my, my stove's not working. And, you know, they're getting the call at 3 a.m. on Christmas Eve saying, hey, uh, somebody's got to come out here and fix this problem, as opposed to the landlord. The fee is relatively inexpensive when you look at what they're actually doing. It can be as low as 5%. It could be as low as $100 per door. So if you have a single town home, $100 per month, which is $1,200 a year, which is also a tax write-off, is given to that management company. And then they basically coordinate all the work. You still pay for the repairs, but you're not you're not actually doing the work yourself and you're not coordinating it. And that's usually where people have the frustration is when they're having to do all the work. And, and just, we've talked about this before as well, too. There's still only 24 hours in your day, right? You just don't have the time to be dealing with those things. So you, and you've, you've talked about this before about, uh, you know, you surround yourself with people who know what they're doing. So giving that, that responsibility to uh, a management company, they know what they're doing and you can trust that that's going to be taken care of. So that's, it's important for your, for people to be able to feel comfortable about that. In your book, The Real Deal, Billion Dollar Real Estate Broker, this, this passion project of yours, it's really taken off. One of the key sections is about multi-level partnering. And what do our listeners need to know about that? I've always looked at roadblocks and said, okay, how do you get past this? So a lot of people say, I don't have the money, or I only have... 10% down payment, how will I ever be an investor? Because the bank needs me to put 20% down. So this is where multi-level partnering comes in. And whether it's with family, friends, uh, a business associate, or just another fellow um, like-minded investor that says, hey, you found the opportunity, I'll partner with you. I'll put in 10%, you put in 10%, and we will split the losses, the profits, the expenses. And it's so my 
my philosophy behind multi-level partnering is it's better to be in the game and be a part of something even in a small way than sitting on the sidelines watching all your friends do it and saying why can't i do it and then cry about it, right so let's get in the game when i was 18 years old um, I'll never do this again. So, you know, speaking about being multi-level partnering, uh, it was myself and I got nine friends together and we formed a corporation called Invest 10 Corp. Of course, that corporation was dissolved within six months because it was a bad, bad idea because you cannot have 10 chiefs trying to, you know, create and bring in their ideas. I like maximum three to four partners, depending on how large the project is, but they have to be like-minded. They have to have the same goals. They have to have an understanding. They have to know, are they in this for the long term or in a couple of years, are they going to want to exit? So really have a thoughtful discussion with whoever you're planning on. Look, family is always the best way to get involved. So if you've got a mom and dad or you've got a son that you want to partner with, uh, even if you're only going with 5% or 7% or 10%, Put something in, let them put the rest. But I'm doing this with my kids. I'm doing this with my nephews where I'm saying, okay, I don't want you guys to wait till you're 30 years old to start investing in real estate. Let's get you in now. You're living at home. You're, you're eating mom and dad's food. You're, you're living at, for free. So let's get that opportunity now for you because it's going to be increasingly more difficult in the future for any young person to enter the real estate market, especially that's why I'm so excited about the first first home savings account uh, that's been introduced that we talked to uh, talked about, and we'll we'll put some of this on if if you're listening and you want more information, you can go to my Instagram account or my Facebook account, and this entire uh, session is also on film and can be listened to on those programs. And and you've opened a bit a bit of a can of worms there, Faisal. Faisal does not need any more nephews and nieces that are just popping up out there thinking Uncle Faisal is going to come through for me. But uh, it's if you have that opportunity, and I I, I really appreciate from that family perspective to say, yeah, you got to look after the people in your family, give them a chance, like you had, and and you you remember what it was like when you you first get started. You had that idea, you know, group of ten. Hey, it's great. But you learned from it. And I'm and you said right at the beginning, I'd never do it again. But the fact that you learned that piece and the other nine people, I'm sure, learned similar, similar uh, lot, you know, life, life lessons as you went through that. It's important it, to be able to look it back. It is. At that. And you know, it gives purpose. So to these young people, like I said, my kids, my niece, my nephews, um, you know, they may not have the 20% to put down, but I want to ensure A, that they have skin in the game. They've got it, you know, I don't care if it was birthday money, Christmas money, whatever money they have saved up, you better put that on the table right now because you're putting that money in. And then it also limits them, their spend. So instead of them going out and buy that, buying that, you know, Gucci ball cap or, um, you know, paying for bottle service at the clubs, uh, right. let's, let's put that money towards savings and start contributing towards your down payment on this property. So it really <laughs> puts your focus in there. And and thanks for for that for that as well. You're right. You get you can't spend it. You, you, if you want to save it, you can't spend it. it, it you've got about a minute, minute, me minute and a half right now. You gaze into that crystal ball right now, Faisal. What do you see? What's we see this market turning around this year? You're feeling pretty good about 2023. I, I am feeling very good because again, as I said earlier on, there's always opportunity in crisis. So this is the time to identify the opportunities. Hunker down, stop your spending, right? And you don't need the government to tell you to stop spending by increasing the interest rates, right? You can figure that out for yourself. Say, look, I've got to spend my money on the important things right now, not on and not waste it. So that's where it's going to come back to you. And, you know, if we go back to the crystal ball, I, I want to say this, especially to young people, the struggles that you will endure today in building up a little bit of a nest egg for yourself it's going to afford you the lifestyle that you want in the future. It's going to give you that beautiful life. It's going to give you the home, the cars, the vacations, the restaurants, all of the things that you're desiring to have today. If you can just put that aside, you're going to earn it because right now you haven't earned it. Right now you're spending money you haven't earned. But if you can invest that money uh, smart, 
right now, that's going to give you and reap you so many benefits in the future. And I'm an example of that, you know, 10 years of no vacations, not, none of the luxuries in life, but I've been able to now make up for it as a result of the struggles that I faced earlier on in my career. Faisal, I want to thank you again for coming on the show today. Always a pleasure to chat with you and to learn something new every time you come on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on again, bro. That was Faisal Susie Walla, Canada's top real estate broker, recently published author of The Real Deal, Billion Dollar Real Estate Broker. Luckily for us, someone willing to share his thoughts on the current real estate market as well. Big thank you to our technical producer, Adam, as well. And thank you, listeners, for joining us. You've been listening to Ask the Experts here on City News 570.